Good evening and welcome to the National Writers Series. I'm Jillian Manning, the Executive Director here at NWS. Let me first say congratulations to our incredible scholarship winners. We wish you all the best of luck and your future endeavors and we can't wait to see what you do next. This evening is the perfect time to think about who we can grow up to be. I'm so pleased to introduce Rochelle Riley, Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Detroit and author of That They Lived, African Americans Who Changed the World. The book shares stories from the childhoods of heroes like Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, Muhammad Ali, and so many more, and includes incredible photographs of both these historical figures and some modern day counterparts. There is truly no other book of American history quite like this one, and we encourage readers young and old to pick up a copy. I'm also honored to introduce our guest tonight, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Leonard Pitts Jr. You've seen his byline in plenty of renowned publications, and you can also find his books, like The Last Thing You Surrender, at your local bookstore. We look forward to spending the coming hour with you. Please join me in welcoming Rochelle Riley and Leonard Pitts Jr. Good evening, all, and welcome. Uh, I'm surprised I'm not seeing Rochelle's picture on my screen, but I'm going to take it on faith that she's there somewhere. Uh, I, are we there? Yes. Okay. Uh, I am uh, pleased to be uh, to be your host uh, this evening and, and, and thankful to uh, Rochelle for asking me and also to the National Writers Series for, uh, for, for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to do this. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't also offer my congratulations to the four scholarship winners. Writers are my favorite type of people. So I'm always happy to see four, uh, you know, uh, or as many as possible, uh, new members of our tribe, I guess for want of a better term. Uh, so we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about uh, Rochelle's uh, latest book, That They Live, and uh, we'll probably branch off from there. And then I believe we'll have a, a space for Q&A for uh, any of you who have questions to, uh, to join the conversation. So Rochelle, I wanna begin with, I, I guess, what is the obvious question and we'll branch off from there, but how did this book begin? What was the genesis? What, what gave you the idea to, uh, to, to put this together? Which is essentially, I should explain, a, a book of um, biographies of African-American historical figures, but tailored for young readers. Why did you feel this was necessary? Well, I have been, uh, as you and I have talked about, Leonard, on a probably 15 or 20 year mission to change the way we teach American history um, because we've been miseducating American children for so long. And that missing history, that stolen, omitted history is a, a big reason why we don't really get along uh, in this country. But this particular book came about because of a moment. I was working on The Burden, a book that you're familiar with because you contributed an essay to it. It was back in 2017 in February. And even when I'm on deadline, I have time for social media. I'm on Twitter all the time and uh, also on Facebook and Instagram. But on Twitter, uh, th this, this woman was posting these photographs of her little girl as iconic African-American women. I saw and, those. And, oh my gosh, so even, even though I was on deadline, you know, one day uh, Daisy Bates showed up and I thought, oh wow, she looks amazing. And I have some of these slides I could show, but um, then, I, I would go back to work because I was hard at work on the book. And then the next day there was another one and it was um, Nikki Giovanni who literally was you know, one of my favorite poets. And I said, you know, Daisy Bates it, it is this woman, this child <laughs> looks like her. Nikki Giovanni is this older woman. This child has embodied the spirit of what she looks like. It wasn't just the makeup and the glasses and the fact that her mom you know, did the whole costume. It was how her five-year-old daughter Lola really captured these folks. And so then of course, I, the next day there was another one and it was Maya Angelou. And I, I said, oh my God, okay. So she, she gets all of this. This, this is a five-year-old kid who I am reading history despite his wrenching pain cannot be unlived. I, I think that if her mom said that to her, she actually understood it. So I decided that I would go to, um, find this woman. I went on Facebook, looked her up. You know, we're reporters. We do this stuff all the time. I sent her a message and said, I love what you're doing. Please tell me how this came about. And she said, I wanted to teach my daughter history. And I figured the best way to do it was to take her love of makeup and uh, my love of photo, you know, photography because she was an amateur photographer. She took the first pictures with an iPhone and I was going to do this. And th that's how it got started. That's how I met her, you know, back in 2017. 
And so each, um, I, I don't know the exact number of people who profile in this book, I'd say 17 or 18, somewhere in that, in that range. There's um, one for a reason. It, there's, no, there's no number in the title, thanks to a very smart editor named Annie Martin, because uh -huh. you can't put a number on all the different people who have done amazing things and deserve right. to be in there. So um, there are 21, and, and I can explain that when we talk about Rosa Parks. Okay, well, now let's talk about Rosa Parks. I was going elsewhere, but now let's talk about Rosa Parks and 21. So um, we had to figure out like, well, first of all, let me tell you, this was a book of women because these were her daughter's photos. Right. And so uh, she didn't want to do this. She said, oh my God, I know who you are. You're this columnist and no, I'm not going to do this book. And I said, oh no, no, really? The, I have a thousand words, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. I have a thousand words for each of these photos. Let me do this. And she said, no, I, I really don't think we should. So I got on a plane and I flew out to Seattle. And I got in a car and drove to Kent, which is a suburb of Seattle, and went to her house. She knew I was coming. I didn't stalk her. <laughs> and I took her family to lunch and finally convinced her to do this. And she mm. said yes. And once she said yes, and I said, oh, my God, you know, we could do an encyclopedia. We can do scientists and business owners and historians and educators. And she said, oh, no, we're not doing all of that. And I said, well, well, if we're only going to do one book, we have to do boys, too, you know, boys to men. Right. She said, well, I will do that if you find a boy. So I said, well, I've got a boy and I flew to Dallas and got my grandson, Caleb. So that's why there are men and women in the book. But let's talk about Rosa Parks. Okay. So when we had to figure out who would be in there and I said, you know, we have hundreds of folks who have done amazing, amazing things, accomplishments, everything from inventions to changing people's lives. I wanna pick people who, who what they did was so big that they literally changed the way that African-Americans are seen or changed the way that we live in America and um, someone like Rosa Parks. Well, Rosa Parks, everybody knows Mother Parks. Her funeral in Detroit that I covered when she passed several years ago was eight hours long. Presidents came, former presidents came, congressional representatives came. Her arrest, um, because she refused to give up her seat to a white man on a bus, is a story that's told in African-American history. And when she told Lola that story, Lola got an understanding of what life used to be like for African Americans. So when she held up that sign, there was this sort of, you know, resolve in, in her, her demeanor that I really loved. But the story that I wanted to make sure people knew was that there was a 15 year old named Claudette Colvin who gave up her seat nine months before Rosa Parks did. And of course, the law did not change until there was a lawsuit. And the lawsuit <laughs> was because of Claudette Colvin. She was the person who was on the lawsuit. That is the thing that, that literally was the action that took down the law. But she was not as famous as Rosa Parks. As a matter of fact, she never got to meet Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks invited her to come and hear her speak um, one, one day, years later, after the lawsuit and after she was a grown up. And she couldn't go because she was a nurse's aide who couldn't get off work. So I wanted to make sure people knew that as a 15 year old, this little girl did that. And all of the stories are like that. Each essay begins, this person became this huge deal, this, you know, this one of a kind person in the world. But when they were younger, this is where they were. So. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna talk to you about, about, about that format. It, it seems that there's a very intentional um, uh, effort in the book to open the door for children to be able to envision themselves in the world of these people that they're reading about. So that in other words, they're not these remote figures who are on marble pedestals. Uh, and I think you do that by, by, the, by the pictures, obviously, in which you know, you've got the kids you know, being able to envision themselves as, as these icons, but also in the structure of the way that you put it together. Each, each as you said, mentioned, each chapter begins with um, so-and-so was this, that, and changed the world. But before that, he was a 10-year-old doing such and such. And then it always ends with um, the lesson. Yeah. You know, but and so what we learned from his life, what what was it you hope? Because obviously that's 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 intentional. What was it you were hoping to convey to young people who read this from that? I, I want young people of all races, all backgrounds, no matter what state they live in, to know that every important person was once a child. So there is mm. something that's happening in your life now that could help you decide who and what you want to be. And it is not what people call you or what people think of you. It's what you answer to or how you see yourself. And I, I think, you know, for instance, Jackie Robinson, when, when I got the pictures, now I'll tell you, Christy, love her. She doesn't do publicity. She's not going on any of these book events or that. Um, but 
what I did was once I got the photos, I then spent a year going through all of the things that had been written about them to find those moments. And I'll tell you, I, this, you think, you know, we're journalists, Leonard, you know, you and I, right. we know every, journalists think they know everything. I mean, that's just the way we are. We, we research everything. We have to know a little bit about everything. We just think we know everything. But the Jackie Robinson one stunned me because out of all the things I knew, and I'm a baseball fan, I didn't know this. So I want to read just the beginning of his. Jackie Roosevelt Robinson would grow up to be the first African-American to play major league baseball in the modern era. But when Jackie was a 16 year old high school student, he was a member of a gang. I remember sitting at my dining room table reading that in one of, and there's a whole library in my house now devoted to this because I didn't go to the library or go to archives. I ordered everything. So I would have it yeah, all. Sounds like me, yeah. You know, we, we got to have yeah. it right there with us. And so- I want it there. And I said, how did I not ever know that? He went from being a gang to listening to his brother and not being in the gang and playing four sports and changing, you know, how we view American baseball and how we view sports in general. I looked for those nuggets. So it's this idea of no matter where you are as a child in your, in your journey, it doesn't foreclose what you could be and where you could end up. That's right. Yeah, that was that was that was very 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 nice. Uh, I'm just curious. Most of the people that that you profile are no longer with us. Um, but have you heard from either? I know uh, Barack Obama's in there, so uh, he's he's one of those who's alive and would have had a chance to see it. Have you heard from any of the people who are who are either profiled or from their families uh, on what they think, particularly of the children's portrayal of them? I have not yet. The book just came out in February. I am hoping that somebody puts it in the former president's hands so he can take a look and. I'll, I'll tell you, um, I was once asked, who did you leave out? And I, I adore Michelle Obama like she was my sister, but um, she is becoming and is going yeah. to be doing amazing things. And I, I think, you know, when I was thinking of people who uh, were in it, it's the people, it's not hidden figures because I even hate that phrase, hidden figures, you know, that's right. because these are people who were amazing and shouldn't have been hidden. These are the people that we know, that we celebrate, that, you know, we celebrate as posters, you know, every February. I wanted people to know more about them, but you can't have, you know, a Barack Obama be alive and have been president and not include him. So he was yeah. he was the living one that I included. He sort of shoehorns his way into, into stuff After, like that, doesn't he? History yeah. plowed him in there. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you. I have to say that for me, your, your book is incredibly timely. I mean, down to meaning today timely, because I just finished my next column, which is on African-American history and the, the way we sort of treat and mistreat it. And as you know, well, if, you, if you've read my column, you know that that's sort of been a recurring theme with me, not just you, you mentioned history being lost. But for me, at this point, as I look at all these laws that are being passed to restrict the teaching of this history, it's not just being lost. There is a conscious and concerted effort to lose it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what do you what do you make of that? Why? You know, the, the column leads with the question, what are they so afraid of? So I'll, I'll ask you that question. What are they so afraid of? I love that. And I think that for the first time in this country, and I'm sorry that it took the death of someone for people to see mm -hmm. it, we're finally facing what has happened. And it's the greatest theft in American history, mm -hmm. uh, except for the, the initial theft of the country. And that's this theft of, of an identity and of this right. entire story, this entire narrative that has deliberately been left out of our lives and our teachings and for children. And again, not just black children, children of all ages and all uh, races and backgrounds to be raised, not understanding the complete history of America. It's no wonder we live and operate in such ignorance and, and, and this, this lack of knowledge. And that lack of knowledge is what makes it possible to have a so-called superior and so-called inferior society. You cannot make people second-class citizens or even make them feel like second-class citizens unless you take, steal that history and that excellence that would prove that that was false. I had a white gentleman on Twitter uh, come after me once, maybe two years ago, uh, saying uh, he didn't know why Black people are in such, you know, egregious shape because we, we've been free, quote, for 150 years. <laughs> <laughs> I had, we always have so they have, I had one to say, why do you act like black people can't make it? Look at Oprah Winfrey and look at Will Smith. And, you know, you, you almost have to laugh because sometimes we have to laugh to keep from crying or screaming or strangling someone. But um, I remember saying to someone, why are serial killers mostly white men? Yeah. You know, do, do I literally take that brush and paint you with that? Why would you think that? And I also say this to people, 
you broke an entire race of people, broke down, treated like animals, literally said, okay, slavery is over, go away, we're not giving you anything, not the 40 acres and a mule, not, you know, just knock yourselves out. And we did, but you still ask why are families broken? And why did we have to work so hard? And what, why is it still so hard? And it's because, and I say this all the time, slavery didn't end, it just changed addresses and it moved to the courtrooms and boardrooms and classrooms and newsrooms of America. And that enslavement continues with the discrimination and the lynching and the Jim Crow laws and all the things that continued to make sure that black people could not succeed at the level of white people. It, it literally is how our country has operated forever. You remind me of a favorite quote, uh, Africans did not become enslaved because they were black, they became black because they were enslaved, um, which is sort of gets to this whole idea of using race as a justification for, as you mentioned, this just sort of inhumane, inhuman treatment. And what's frightening is, you know, there was once a time when I say when I was a kid, when you could engage in that treatment and still hold your head up as a white person and, and be invited to all the good parties and stuff. And then it went away. I'm not saying the, that that feeling, that animus went away, but the ability to do that and still be a, a valued and, and well-respected member of society went away. And now it seems as if it's coming back. There are people who are just rank outright white supremacists who are serving in Congress, <coughs> who are president, <coughs> excuse me. You know? And it's just... It's like it, in, in America, hate has moved in cycles. So it went from, yeah. okay, let's just be real open about it and have barbecues and parties while we're lynching somebody. <laughs> oh, well, wait, yeah. we're going to put on white hoods because we don't want people to know that it's us. Oh, now we don't have to have white hoods. We don't even have to like hide ourselves. As a matter of fact, we can go and storm the Capitol and then wonder why people want to arrest us. It, 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 it's the cycles of hate that, that and, and we're in a really bad cycle now because people truly are. Katie bar the door. We can just, we can, you know, do voter suppression. We can literally pass laws that say you can't give water to people who are standing in line to vote. We can make sure you don't vote by mail. I, I, I'm looking at what's happening and it is truly this sort of attempt to return to the Confederacy. Yeah, and yet what's frustrating is that you also know that there are so many white people, one who don't know, or at least before George Floyd did not know, and who, if they knew, as the George Floyd case indicates, would be standing there shoulder to shoulder with you as happened during the civil rights movement as happened during the during the, the pre-civil war era. So that, you, yeah, which sort of gets back to another reason that, you know, some of us don't want this history known by all of us because it would make people mad yes. and, it would, and it, would create, it would create activism. And that's why it's so important for me in particular that we do not let a, a small group of people who are literally operating on hate appear to represent everyone and why it's so important for people who don't agree with that hate to stand up and say, no, that's not me. And this book for me is a way for us to remind all children that um, you don't have to be those things that somebody says that you have to be. Talk about that a little bit more because that, that is one of the more frustrating things that, and I, I asked a classroom full of, I've asked classrooms full of black kids on occasion, if you had never, seen yourself and seen a black person on television or heard music or whatever, who would you be? In other words, what is the influence of all that stuff that comes to you that tells you who you are on shaping who it is that you actually, that you actually become? And what do they tell you when you ask that? Because that's a really good question. They're sort of dumbfounded. It's like they've never really thought of it, you know, which tells me to the degree to which they're shaped by that stuff. I, I think that, and I know that when I talk to my friends who are white, and, and they're horrified all the time. And, and right. it's hard for them to talk about it because in some instances, it's not that they didn't think it was true. It's not that they didn't believe me. It's that they just never understood the overwhelming, you know, the burden of it, that the mass yeah. of it on your back all the time. None of them have to have the conversations with their children that we have to have with our children. None of them have to face the, oh my gosh, thousands of microaggressions that we face all the time. I have been with friends who have been livid because of something they saw. And I'm like, that's a little thing. We don't have to fight yeah. over it. <laughs> that, that, that's, I'll let you know what I need you to like strap on <laughs> that. That's not it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, that there's this great moment in history where we are now, where we have a chance to literally talk about that. The, the, the book literally is just to make sure that kids know, and I'm, all kids, 
black kids know they're not just descendants of the enslaved and for white kids to know that black kids are not just the descendants of the enslaved. And we have got to take that back to the textbooks that this Texas cabal, because Texas buys more textbooks that are trying to erase, not, not accidentally, but erase that history that is necessary for us to have a full understanding of each other. You mean talk about the uh, immigrants and workers who came from Africa and stuff oh, yeah, like that? Yeah, migrant workers who just came to help build America and <laughs> didn't have to be paid because they got, you know, what is it? Cots and a, and a squat, no, cots and a, <laughs> They, they got a cabin and, and food. So it's like, so they weren't really like mistreated. I, I hear people say those types of things and I literally don't bother to engage them because they're too far gone. Yeah, it, it's, it's funny, you and I don't, but you, you mentioned your white friends and it uh, reminded me of a colleague of mine. Uh, my, she was my assistant until she retired, uh, who used to read my emails. That was one of her jobs. Yeah. And after a few months, she came to me and said, I hate white people. And I said, <laughs> I had to remind her, first of all, that she's white. You know? <laughs> and she said, but I don't know how you're not vibrating with anger. And I, you know, I told her, well, you know, you've only been vicariously black for a few months. So, you know, you, you're still calibrating. Yeah. <laughs> you've been doing this for a long time. I did this yeah. just in Detroit for almost 20 years of that stuff. And yeah. The, the most important uh, missive that I ever got was a letter from a guy who um, wrote that he used to be a racist, but from reading my column and having some conversations with me, he had a greater understanding of who he was. My editor had that frame for me. And mm. I, we have, it, it's just like that, uh, it was either CNN or MSNBC where the black reporter was talking to different people after the Floyd verdict. And this white guy was wearing a windbreaker and he's just standing out there and you could tell he was just so tortured. And he said, I, I don't know what to do. Tell me what I can do, how I can do something. And I literally tweeted out, do not mock people when they are standing up saying, I want to stand with you. That, that is important because that is the only way we're going to get anything changed. Yeah, I, you're a better woman than I am a guy because I've, I've had a couple of those, of, of those letters over the years and they make me feel good, but then they also remind me of how many other people you talk about to, this stuff to and it just sort of, shh, you know, right over the head or they just believe what it is that they that they choose to believe and they're not gonna change it no matter how much logic or, or feeling you bring to I, it. I, I'm not so much better than you. I try to engage the folks where I think there's hope. The rest of them, I just block or ignore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, then we're on the same page. Yeah. Uh, we have we have a question from the audience or comment. My, my biracial African slash white uh, grandson is growing up in a loving but all white family and community he is nine years old. What can I do to support his black heritage? Your book sounds like a good start. So what, what would you what would you suggest? Oh, that is so nice. Um, and I'm yeah. so appreciating the question. And yes, the, the book is a good start. But the other thing is to just be willing to have the conversations. You know, I've been watching This Is Us because I'm one of their biggest fans. My yeah, me too. follows me on Twitter. And, and I think that what happens sometimes is people think that they shouldn't bring it up. That let's not yeah. talk about it. When my daughter was four, she padded into my bedroom and said, I don't want to be brown anymore. And that changed our lives forever. I wrote a column about that. As a matter of fact, I wrote that column while I was an editor. And that's how I got my column when I became mm -hmm. a kid. But I, I told her, um, you, you cannot be upset because people are different, because everybody is different, whether you can see it on the outside or not. Right. What you want to do is celebrate the difference. So I tell people all the time, the worst thing you can do is tell me that you are colorblind or you want to be colorblind because that's a disability. It's a horrible thing. And I do not want to hear that you are helping me by you know, pretending like I'm not the color that I am and have the history that I am and have the rich narrative of culture that's in my life. So just, just literally be willing to talk about it. Just go, go with how they're feeling. Make sure you check in with them. It, it will always be hard, but it's never impossible. Are there, are there things that you can do in terms of exposing them to not, not just things like your book, but exposing them to, to certain cultural influences or, 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 or whatever that, can, that yeah. can perhaps help to unisolate that child? Two things. One is go to the Smithsonian National mm. Museum. Um, right. We go to Washington all the time to go to the Washington Monument and to go to the White House now that we can go to the White House again. But um, just find ways to teach that. But the other thing is make sure you're talking with their teachers right and paying attention to those things that's one of the most important things that you can do because that's where they spend a large part of their day and they're away from you and sometimes they're in the mm -hmm. hands of people that you don't even know and i i used to literally be a room parent for a day if i had to um mm -hmm. because you have to know what my daughter was in this um 
it accelerated elementary school. And, and so there were only three black kids in the classroom and she had made a 90 on a test instead of 100. And I said, oh, well, you got one wrong. And she said, yeah, but my teacher said it's okay because minorities are taken care of in this country or some such BS. So of course I took the next day off and became the room parent. So I told yeah. her to ever say that to any child of any color again, but particularly the children in this room. And the worst part was the, the word she missed, you had to spell it and define it was quiche. And I said, but you know quiche. And she said, I didn't remember what that was. I said, when we go to La Madeleine and have the egg pie, she said, why don't they just call it egg pie? So <laughs> anyway. You, I'd you, be willing, I, I bet money the teacher said, but I'm not a racist. Oh, she was horrified. She said, oh, I didn't mean it that way. I said, no, it doesn't matter how you meant it. What you literally told her was she didn't have to work as hard because somebody was gonna take care of her and that is never going to be true. So if I help change just the lives of those three kids that year in that room, that, that yeah. matters. You have to be involved. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned This Is Us. For those of those who aren't listening, uh, the storyline that, that Rochelle's referring to, Sheldon, um, Sheldon K, what's Sterling K. Brown. Sterling K. Sheldon, Brown. Renaming the man. Sterling K. Brown plays uh, Randall Pearson, who's this black guy, this brilliant black guy who was uh, uh, orphaned at birth and grew up in this, this lovely white family, except that there was a... There was, I guess, kind of a blind spot in that they they never saw the need to talk to really talk to him about about race uh, and not not to fanboy on this, but the episode with uh, him and his brother finally coming to terms. Oh my gosh! Was that just? It, it's some of the most brilliant writing that's ever been yes. on television. And 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 those are the types of conversations that we don't have because people think that black people don't want to have them and white people don't know how to have them. When all you have to do is just try to have them. He was trying to explain to his brother that. You know, it, it's not just the things that you didn't see, it's the things that you did and you were just tone deaf about it. Like yeah. he wanted to give them a, a stolen, a, a fake ID so they could go drinking. And it was like, a, they were in college. So it was two college kids, it's a 40 year old black man. And he said, what am I supposed to do with these? Well, he's a black guy. <laughs> he looks just like you. Not, not racist, but you know, that should be enough. So anyway. Yeah, I think sometimes people have this difficulty understanding that, you know, race, racism, racial blind spots, whatever you want to call it, can live side by side with being a good person. Yeah. It's, it's, it, and I think people really have difficulty with that complexity. I think of, of Obama uh, talking about his grandmother, who was capable of saying some pretty racist stuff, and yet loved her little brown grandchild yeah. to death. And both of those, you have to honor both of those things. And until we're, we, we evolve the complexity to do that, I think we're, we're always gonna be you know, spinning tires on the mud here. Well, I tell people, you know, racism isn't always uh, intentional, but it always yeah. hurts. Yeah, it's not always intentional and it's not always uh, you know, crosses burning on the front lawn or, or any rest of that stuff. It, it's, it's, it's something else. So um, what is it? Um, what is it that you're hoping that will, will come of the book in terms of in terms of for 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 for, for African American uh, kids in particular? I I really want, and again, it, it's really for all kids. I really mm. want people to understand that you cannot look at the posters in February. You cannot just pretend like this is some sort of exotic thing to study as this separate thing that's apart from American history it's all together, it's all woven together, it's all a part of American culture. And once we start to tell that woven story, instead of you know the segregated history that we teach, that we'll really have a better understanding of each other. I want them to know these people in particular, but I want them to know that they were kids, this is what they were doing then, and think, what are you doing now that might affect who you are and what you might become? Thurgood Marshall, literally, his dad took him to a courtroom to watch trials so he could teach him the law. So that's why he became literally the attorney who won more cases before the Supreme Court than anyone else and became a Supreme Court justice. It didn't have to do with him being black, it had to do with him being fair. And quite frankly, that fairness and fighting for that fairness is what should honor him. So I never say Thurgood Marshall, you know, a black man who, no, it's Thurgood Marshall who was one of the literally biggest change agents for American history ever. Oh, and he was also black. Yeah. Why is this stuff so difficult sometimes for, for decent white Americans uh, to, to be able to discuss? It really seems to be difficult for them. I, I notice a lot of times for, for us as black folk, it's almost too easy. You, you, you grow up and, and, and it's required, it, you, you, you learn to, and, it, and it's required to be very fluent in this. 
But for white folks, it seems to be the exact opposite. It's almost as if, I remember a reader saying that you shouldn't talk about race because it's not polite. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, here's what we've done in America. We literally have set up a, an entire ecosystem, an entire tradition, an entire way of life where we don't talk about it. And that is what we've done for generations. So now trying to change it, it's just not, it's like, why are we doing that? That's not what we do. That's not what we've done, but it's what we should be doing. So it's like turning a ship that was, you know, people in the front of the ship are like, we're doing just fine. What's the problem? While people down in steerage are going, no, it ain't fine. <laughs> you know, we, we can tell you a little bit something about life if you would just pay attention. So it, it's this, it's this willful ignorance that, that we have allowed to be uh, the way of life in America. As long as we don't know about it, we're fine. We have our picnics, we have the 4th of July, we have you know, all the things that the accoutrements of, of American life and apple pie and, and it's wonderful. But when you bring up that other stuff, well, that makes America a little uglier. Um, I remember that uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones in the Forward to the Burden wrote this brilliant thing. Uh, the Burden came out in 2018. And, and I knew that, that something bigger was coming from her because of the way that she talked about these things. And she said, the biggest problem, and she said it better than this, and I don't have my copy here, but the biggest problem is that we as black people and this whole discussion about enslavement remind America of all that America is not. We can't have the pretty wrapped in a bow. This is, this is who we are to the world and to ourselves if we continue to pay attention to that ugly part that we've managed to tamp down, and put in the closet and not talk about. And it, it was never tamped down or, or put away for mm -hmm. you know, everybody who lives with that. It was just tamped down and put away in your closet, but that's yeah. not possible. You remind me of a quote from a Jewish writer that I read, and I don't, I'm gonna probably mangle it, but it was something to the effect of that part of the problem in terms of European anti-Semitism is that the Germans cannot forgive the Jews for Auschwitz. And I thought that was such a profound observation. <laughs> That, mm, that, yeah, that, that is yeah. totally profound. And that is exactly yeah. what it is. When we bring up enslavement, we are messing with the narrative. It's like, don't talk right. about that. People are going to think that we were bad people or that this was something yeah. that everybody liked. And it's why when you talk about reparations, and I don't like the word reparations, I tell people we should stop using it. We need to just mm. start using invoice. You know, we literally, this was labor that built America. It's owed. Let's not mm. talk about reparations. You can't repair that kind of damage. But um, I, I literally um, have tried to figure out how we can have a conversation that people say, if you talk about it, you are ruining America. You are making yeah. us worse. It, it's not just that it's impolite. It's that, and it's why when you talk about reparations, you, you'll have some white people who say, well, I didn't do that, as if they have to take personal blame for it. And it's like, Nobody yeah. said you did it, America did it. And America kept doing it legally through laws and discrimination for decades. You can't just say, okay, everything's fine now because it has affected how generations of people lived and where we are now. We talk about a wealth gap, like we don't understand why there is one. Yeah, it's like I didn't intern any Japanese, but I wasn't upset when the nation you know, gave, I think it was $20 billion in reparation for those who were interned. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. I'm sorry, go on. And I was going to say, there's still people who don't know that because we don't teach history. There are yeah. people who are just learning tonight that the United States paid reparations to the Japanese that they put in internment camps during World War II because it's like, oh, okay, we're sorry about what happened to you because you were already over here. But when you say the word reparations associated with Black people, it's like, well, we didn't do that. that. That's too long ago. You need to let that go. But let's get to yeah. some questions. Yeah, we got questions from, uh, from your admirers here. So let's see. Uh, I'd love to know more about your work as a director of arts and culture in Detroit. What does a typical day look like for you? Oh my gosh, thank you for that question. Whoever asked, my day starts at 5 a.m. and it ends Oh my at God, <laughs> too early. <laughs> well, let me just say that the city of Detroit, embarrassingly, had not had an Office of Arts and Culture for more than two decades. Okay. So when I got ready to leave the free press, I had lunch with the mayor and said, okay, I'm going to be leaving the paper. What should I be doing? And I asked him because we know each other, you know, we're friends. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, asking for a job because there wasn't any job in city government that I would take. I, I just would not do that. I'd written too many columns about city government. <laughs> but he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to find a building and, you know, turn it into a Detroit Black repertory theater because we're the largest city with this large a Black population without one. He didn't hear any of that. All he heard was the word theater. He said, theater, are you into the arts? 
you, you like, I said, well, I'm a photographer and I sing show tunes on demand and I have a small film company that just does scripts and I paint and yeah, I love the arts. I go to Broadway, I go to the symphony. I'm, I'm sitting here just, you know, why? He said, I need a director of arts and culture. I've been trying to get this done. And I said, well, it's embarrassing that we don't have one and tell me about the job. He said, it doesn't exist. You get to make it up. How often does somebody tell you you get to make up a yeah. job? Like you can't say no to that. So I said, right. yeah. and I got a call saying, welcome to the city of Detroit. And I went, well, wait a minute. I'm working on a children of trauma project that I still need. <laughs> so I, I started in the spring of uh, 2019. And my job is to oversee the city's investment in the arts, to oversee its support of the creative workforce. And that's the biggest thing I had to teach City Hall and to teach our community. We're talking about people who do this for a living. This is not somebody who works on the line at the auto plant during the day and paints at night. These are people who do this for a living and they have to be treated like the small businesses that they are, so. When, when the news is, is going crazy, do you ever miss the, the outlet of the column? Every single time, <laughs> every wondering. single time, oh my God. When um, I, I knew on election night that uh, mm -hmm. Joe Biden was gonna win. And what I wanted to do was just to call for calm because mm -hmm. I knew there would be madness and there was madness and I didn't write right. anything all through that. I did write something, the undefeated asked me to write something, I think it might've been about George Floyd and I was asked to write something about John Conyers. So every now and again, somebody will call and ask me to write something. But if I were doing it for myself, if I had not taken a job and just done the blog mm -hmm. on a website, I'd be writing every day. Just okay. I thought so. Uh, someone else wants to know, uh, was there a reason that, that there were specifically 21 stories? You had mentioned, you had alluded to that uh, earlier. Was 21 a magic number for any reason? There could have been 2,100. I'd worked with Wayne State University Press, which mm -hmm. published the book, and um, we had to winnow it down, and uh, we were going to do 20. And I said, well, why do we have to do that? And they said, well, you know, you want it to be manageable. You want people to not have too many. And I said, well, we got to put Claudette Colvin in there because she wasn't in. I said, so right. 21. They said, well, 21 sounds odd. I said, then just don't put a number because the number could be 2,100. It could be 21,000, but we need to put her in. So that's why they're in the same chapter. But yeah, Claudette yeah. And, and Rosa Parks. And I'm glad you, you included her, by the way, because she's often forgotten. Yes. Um, which profile stuck with you the most and why? Well, I will read you the beginning of that one because I am in Detroit. Uh oh, and um, Aretha, be Stevie. <laughs> no, 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 Stevie. Stevie's just, he's one of Re, the. Re, Re. There you go. There okay. you go. Aretha Louise Franklin would grow up to become the queen of soul, an international R and B singing sensation, and a quiet civil rights leader who helped African Americans gain equality. But when Aretha was twelve years old, she was pregnant. Now I know because I'm here in Detroit where we have a lot of young girls who are dealing with this, that this could change a life. Right. That you do not have to be defined by anything that happens when you're, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. Uh, it was the same thing with Stevie Wonder, you know, <laughs> his, mom, his mom walked him into uh, Hitsville, this little boy, 12 years old and blind and said, he's going to be a star. He can really sing. And Barry Gordy said, you're right. Now suppose his mom had not done that, you know, um, this was one of Caleb's favorite pictures too, because he <laughs> loved playing Stevie Wonder. That's some of the music he knows. I taught my daughter how to clean house playing Respect, you know, by Aretha <laughs> Franklin. Um, but, but so much of, of what we know about music and life and, and, and the, way people ex ex the way people embraced music by black artists came from Motown and came from Aretha. But bigger than that, um, I broke the story a few years ago um, right after Aretha died about how she <laughs> had this interview with Jesse Jackson. And I said, I know you haven't told this to anybody, how she used to pay the payroll for civil rights leaders who were out trying to change the world and they would run out of money. I said, I don't know that people knew that. She was right there with her dad when he planned the march in Detroit where Martin Luther King wound up at the convention center and did the I Have a Dream speech first. The first I Have a Dream speech, yeah. A couple of months before he did it in right. office in Washington. There are all these amazing points in history that if we taught all of American history would change how we all see each other. Yeah, okay. Um, as a white woman, how do I start the conversation with a black person without offending? 
you say, I'm a white woman and I wanna have a conversation with you without offending you. I really want to understand some things and learn some things. Some of my friends who are white, we didn't come together because we were white or black. We came together over the things that we had in common. One of my good friends, Steph Caffanegro, who literally I only met like after we had been on Facebook and Twitter talking to each other, mm -hmm. were huge This Is Us fans. We would literally be on Twitter on, on uh, Tuesday nights, counting down until we got to talk about <laughs> And so now we have conversations that are deeper than that. Find the things that you have in common. See, th this is how easy it is. If you know somebody, then you know the things that have nothing to do with their color. Get to know okay. somebody beyond their color. Find yeah. out whether they play tennis, whether they liked the young and the restless or days of our lives, whether they like chocolate or not. Um, and, and just get to know people and pick a person. Don't try to get to know everything about everybody all at once. You know, if you work someplace, and there's somebody who's a colleague of yours and you've never talked to them because they're black and you didn't think that you should have a conversation, go over and see if they want to grab a cup of coffee and ask, you know, what kind of books are you reading and get yeah. to know people where they are. Yeah. Once you have that authentic basis for friendship, then it's, it's I think it, I would think it becomes a lot easier. Yes. Uh, let's see. What do you think of the book White Fragility? And do you have any recommendations for great anti-racism books? Um, Ibram Zindi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, is most important. Um, mm -hmm. Both of um, Isabel Wilkerson's books. Um, yeah, the Cast and um, yeah, The cast. Great uh, yes. um, Warmth of Other Suns. Literally, if, if you, everything you read about the story that you didn't get in history books will give you a fuller picture of what other people might be like, and then you will learn that we're not that different. There's, right. there's not, you know, the, the biggest difference are the differences we created. To, to, to fit a formula. Um, but if you, if you literally Google, I go to the Google every day for something. If you Google um, great American books, uh, great black American books, you will get a list of a hundred different books. Pick the ones that sound interesting to you, um, but be sure and get my book, The Burden, because if nothing else, it will help you to understand what that's like to carry that burden and how it's time for black Americans to be able to put that burden down. America shouldn't just allow it, it needs to get out of the way so that we can. Down by the riverside, I'm sorry. <laughs> that just started playing in my head. Lay down. Lay down. <laughs> um, let's see, um, I'd like another book of your columns or essays, any plans? Oh my gosh. Well, uh, I have been asked to do a sequel to The Burden because once I talked about The Burden, I've been working on a book called Laying the Burden Down to talk mm -hmm. about um, the 80 conversations I had around the country about that and what we can do to change things. But I've also just been working on this novel since 2008. All right, <laughs> It started- gonna come, play, gonna come play in my playground. I come know, on with it. I know, I'm scared. Um, it started as a short story in Nick Del Banco's uh, class when I was a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan. Uh, and based on that, the head of the uh, Master of Fine Arts program asked if I would, you know, seek an MFA, but it's a full-time job. And I said, no, I like my column. I can't do that. But I've now expanded it into a novel and I would turn my computer around, except you don't want to see this, but the chapter, <laughs> the chapter, my dining table is round and it's spread around the edges of my dining room table, all the chapters as I go through and rewrite them for probably the, I don't know, 22nd time. Only 22nd? Oh, wow. You're lazy, oh. man. <laughs> <laughs> But I didn't touch it for a long time. I was doing other things, so. All right. Uh, let's see, thank you for this book. How do you plan to get this into the hands of ch school children across the country? I have some folks who are working on getting it to Detroit school children now, and I am asking for a recommendation from the American Library Association so that they can recommend it to all their libraries across the country. But I'm counting on folks like the folks on this call to call the school district where you are and tell them this is something they should have. Um, mm -hmm. A friend of mine, Alice Randall, who just wrote Black Bottom Saints, she's amazing, New York Times bestselling author, she teaches uh, teachers how to teach children literature. Um, that's what mm -hmm. she teaches at Vanderbilt. She's going to use it as one of her textbooks. So uh, it, it can happen when people ask for it. I, I did a uh, session. Um, all of these have been Zoom. So the great mm -hmm. thing about this is unlike the burden, I've been to places all over the country, right here at my dining room table, which is where I'm sitting now. But I was doing a Zoom in Seattle and the school district um, was on the line. They, they had officials on the line where they wanted to get it for you know the, the kids in their district. So it's happening that way. But it will happen even more when people make the call for it. So call a school district, 
tell a superintendent, this is a book that kids should read and they should get them for their kids. Okay, we have one last question here. Mm -hmm. Although I miss reading your pieces in the free press, I am so very glad for your new ventures. Thank you for helping us all to improve ourselves. That said, who inspires you? Wow. Well, I'll tell you a quick story that I think Leonard has heard before. Um, when I was a um, junior at the uh, University of North Carolina, uh, you have to get an internship so that you can write news articles so that you can get a job when you graduate. And uh, nobody in my family owned a car except my grandfather. I was raised by my grandparents. And uh, so uh, the uh, News and Observer, this, the newspaper in the state capital of Raleigh offered me an internship, but Chapel Hill is in Chapel Hill and the News and Observer was in Raleigh, the state capital, 40 miles away. And um, I said, well, gosh, I'm not gonna be able to take that internship. I'm not gonna be able to you know, work at a newsroom. I'm never gonna be able to write any stories. I'm never gonna be a journalist. I may as well go home and work at a gas station. And I got on the bus and I went home that weekend and I was miserable and I climbed into bed and I didn't move. And my grandfather was a very gruff man, sixth grade education. And he said, what's wrong with you? And I told him, you know, I got this offer for this job but I would have to drive back and forth from Chapel Hill to Raleigh and I couldn't take it. And so, you know, all that studying I'd done to be a journalist was for naught and I went back to bed. That was on a Friday afternoon after I'd taken the bus back to Tarboro, Little Tarboro. Well, the next morning, Saturday morning, bright and early, I mean bright and early, he knocked on my door. He said, go outside, see whose car that is outside. Now, my grandfather didn't ask questions. It's like he told you what to do. And because he was Mr. Benny Pitt, you got up and did it. So I put on my robe and I went out and I looked. There parked in front of our house was a 1974, this used Ford Maverick, blue and white, clean as a whistle, nothing in the glove box, nothing on the seats, nothing in the trunk. I said, there's nothing in here, you know, that can tell me whose car this is. He said, now you can get to work. And he walked back in the house. That moment and what he did is why I have a career. That moment and what he did got me to the News and Observer, which got me to the Dallas Times Herald, which got me to the Washington Post, which got me to the Louisville Courier Journal, which got me to the Detroit Free Press, which is why I'm in two halls of fame in Michigan and North Carolina, and I have this book. So I remain inspired by Mr. Benny Pitt. And I don't want you to say his name, Leonard. Mr. Mr. Benny Pitt. He oh, remains my inspiration. He died and was buried on my birthday in the year 2000. But mm. I always remember to write everything that I'm writing as if I'm reading it to him and to my grandmother, Loni Pitt, who I have to remember would have to give him permission to have given me that car. So <laughs> I thank the <laughs> both of them. That's a beautiful story. Uh, I have heard that story before, but it, it does not get old. I love that story. <laughs> and I can see him in my, in, in, in my, in my mind's eye. Uh, I think that we're about out of time, but I would like to leave you the final, the final word. If there's anything that we didn't cover that wasn't asked that you'd like to say about either this book or African-American history. I, I just want to thank Christy Smith Jones for taking a moment to listen to her daughter and to decide that she was ready to learn history. I want every American, I don't care what color you are, I don't care where you are, to know that you are most responsible for what your children learn. Teach them the whole history and they will grow up to be better, better people. And that's what we need right now as we face some of the greatest sort of, you know, travails that we're going to have um, with people sort of deciding it's okay to hate. It's not okay. So let's make sure that we know who people were and just be grateful that they lived. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much. I guess now we do the awkward Zoom way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for a great interview. My Thank pleasure. you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> Thank you. And good night. Good night. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We hope you'll all continue the conversation by purchasing a copy of That They Lived from your favorite independent bookstore. Thank you again to our donors and major sponsors, Cordia, the Northwest Michigan Arts and Culture Network, event underwriter Ann Montgomery, and the Traverse City Record Eagle. This event is also made possible in part by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And thanks to you, our viewers. Your support makes all the difference and the proceeds from our events help fund our Raising Writer Literacy programs to help share the love of reading and writing. Thank you and good night.